This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today's conversation is with Professor Laurent Dubois. He'll be talking about the politics of soccer. Professor Dubois' upcoming book is Soccer Empire, the World Cup and the Future of France. Here at Duke, Professor Dubois has appointments in history and romance studies. He teaches a course on World Cup and world politics. You can check out its website at soccerpolitics.com. There you can also find his soccer politics blog. Everyone watching is invited to ask Professor Dubois a question. To do that, post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. Professor Dubois, we're here at your office hours, and as we speak, the World Cup draw is getting underway in Cape Town, South Africa. This is the lottery that determines which teams will play each other in the first round of the World Cup. And as you monitor it here in the studio, what will you be watching for? Well, this is really the culmination of, a, of a many, many months of qualifying rounds. We now know which 32 teams will be playing in the World Cup. Today, we're going to get to learn uh, who they're going to play against in the first three games that they play in these kind of vital first games in the round. So there's 32 teams. Only 16 will go on to the next round. Um, today, we'll find out um, who's the, who their competition is going to be. We're going to learn what the big matchups are going to be, and we'll be able to really start to predict and think about um, what, what the, the story of this World Cup is going to look like as it begins. Basically, what we're going to see is uh, people picking team names from a hat, but what about the whole presentation? What are you going to be watching for in terms of the drama around this? Well, this is, uh, I mean, it's funny in some ways because it's basically a very tedious event, right? In other words, in, in its earlier iterations, it really involved uh, men in suits from FIFA drawing lots out of a hat. They've upgraded it over the years. Now it's in, there are bowls and little, little, little balls that are pulled out of bowls with names of teams in them. Um, over the years, they've increasingly brought in celebrities, uh, soccer stars, but also actresses um, and others. Today, Charlize Theron will be there um, in order to make it a little bit more of a fancy and exciting event. Um, of course, the crucial thing basically that people are looking for is uh, what teams are going to be in what groups. So in some ways, there's a lot of a lot of uh, kind of um, th theater around it, I guess you could say, um, to kind of highlight its importance. Um, but the crucial question is uh, what what comes out of those those little balls and um, what the groups end up looking like. Professor Dubois, before we go any further in full disclosure, would you tell us who you're rooting for in the World Cup? Uh, that's a, it's a difficult question, actually. I mean, I, I've traditionally rooted for France. As you know, France has had a very rough qualifying season and managed to get to the World Cup through a very questionable uh, game, and in particular, a handball. Um, so uh, it's left a lot of French fans in a kind of confused state. Um, I also have always rooted, uh, like a lot of people, I mean, I love the Brazilian team. Um, I have other favorites. I'm really excited about uh, the African teams that are in the World Cup, and I think like a lot of people would really love to see um, some of those African teams um, uh, really uh, go go very far in the tournament, maybe all the way to the final um, if they could. So that's one of the things that we'll be looking for. I think, um, you know, when you go into a World Cup, you have to be ready for so many different outcomes. Um, sometimes it's good to have a couple of different teams you're rooting for. Well, since you've mentioned it, let's go to a question here from a viewer. This one comes from Jeff, and he asks, what should FIFA have done with France, and mm -hmm. can this really affect European politics? Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good question. I mean, this was an incredibly controversial uh, qualifying qualification. Um, one, first of all, that came on the uh, uh, after a whole season of France really kind of disappointing in many ways. Um, and uh, finally qualifying at the last minute through this 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 uh, this play, which which involved an obvious handball um, that the referee did not call. So um, there's a way in which uh, this is a really extreme version of something that we do actually see quite frequently in soccer, which is that referees calls or lack of calls uh, really have an incredibly powerful impact on the game. And we can go through the history of World Cup games themselves um, and see they often really are determined by w whether a referee calls or does not call a call something. Um, um, so I think in addressing the question of the, the handball in Thierry Henry, FIFA, what they essentially did, I mean, the way I kind of described it on the blog is they, they kind of 
considered and maybe even looked into a, a certain kind of abyss, which would have been the, the what, what would happen if FIFA um, replayed this game or allowed for a replay of this game, um, and how would that play as a precedent? In other words, would that mean um, a, a, an increase or that in the future people could look back to this game um, and make claims based on the decision FIFA made with France and Ireland? Um, the reason that it's a, a very difficult thing is because so often, again, as I've said, so often uh, referees uh, can, can see, in, in retrospect, seem to have made uh, erroneous pl erroneous calls that actually determine the outcome of, of very important games. Um, so it's really hard to know what FIFA really should have done. Obviously, depending on your perspective, Ireland really wanted a replay. Indeed, even Thierry Henry um, suggested that replay would be a good solution. Um, in the end, FIFA, I think, took a more conservative course, not wanting to set a precedent in that direction. Um, but of course, um, there's going to be perhaps implications for Thierry Henry himself. Uh, they're looking into that. There's questions about whether this will once again revive pushes for a, a certain use of video replay, um, which has been long resisted in the sport for various reasons. Um, more referees and all these kinds of this incident will obviously create those kinds of questions. And and uh, on a bigger a bigger issue in some ways is that I think France, you know, is going to go into the. To, to the World Cup with a certain kind of pall around it, and they're going to really need to uh, redeem themselves. I think if they really play well, if the players do well in the World Cup, people will perhaps forget the way they got into the, uh, the World Cup itself. But if they don't, um, people will wonder whether they will, again, wish that they hadn't had, uh, that Ireland might be there. And yesterday, Charlize Theron in the, in the uh, sort of uh, play, you know, the, the, uh, the, the practice for the draw today pulled out the France ball and said Ireland as a kind of joke about this this particular issue. So, Professor Dubois, we have about 250 people participating in this office hours session, and everyone is invited to join the conversation by asking a question on the Duke University Facebook page, tweeting with the tag Duke Live, or sending an email to live at duke.edu. Now, Professor Dubois, to play the role of the ignorant American why should I care about the World Cup draw? I mean, it's not like we're talking about the Super Bowl or the NCAA basketball tournament. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's interesting about this is, again, even though, as I said, this event is, uh, you know, in some ways not super exciting to watch. Uh, they estimate about 200 million people are tuning in. I think maybe even greater in 2006. I think the figures were even higher um, who watched the World Cup draw, which means that uh, concretely, it's actually an event with, a, with a, as much of a viewing audience or even a larger one than the Super Bowl worldwide, um, which itself is kind of interesting since, of course, it's, it's not a sporting event, but really just a, a prediction of sporting events to come. Um, so that in itself, I think, just gives a sense of how this is really an incredibly huge event, the World Cup as, as a global event. Um, there's people all over the world watching this event, and people invest enormous hopes and enormous importance in what they're going to see today, because um, I think the World Cup, really more than any other sports competition, um, really uh, is one in which um, the, na the, kind of the international nature of it and the fact of, of nations coming together, um, it just becomes a very intense thing. Obviously, there is the Olympics is the other event that we might think about. But in the World Cup, you have uh, one team representing one nation in certain games, um, potentially in um, elimination matches. So the drama of the World Cup is just intense. And for fans, um, you know, it's really the, the fate of their nation in some ways actually resides in the hands of these, of these teams and these matchups. Uh, I should say that I'm here in the studio I do have a screen showing uh, coverage of the draw. So if I'm a little distracted looking to my left, it's because um, I'm kind of cheap keeping track of what's going on in the draw itself, as some of you probably are as well. Um, and so as news comes in, uh, in a little while, we'll be able to comment on what's going on there. Professor Dubois, we've got a question here by email, and it comes from David, and he asks, People often ascribe political motives for selection decisions. Mm -hmm. Are some countries' fans more paranoid than others <laughs> about the World Cup draw. Um, I think you know anything like this, where these decisions of such magnitude are made, are, it's always going to generate suspicions, concerns, worries. Um, there's just the, even the question of seeding and how the categories are, are done. Um, all of those things are always going to generate, I think, uh, suspicions. Whether some fans are more paranoid than others is a good question. I mean, I think. Um, you know, there have been, there's a whole long history of fans feeling like they've been hard done by in one way or another by the draw, by referees, by many other decisions where they've played and so forth. Um, I mean, this is a sport in which all of the decisions that go on are minutely examined. All the things that go on on the field are minutely examined. 
Um, one anthropologist who writes soccer just talks about the, the, perhaps the reason it's such an incredible passion is because it's it's a kind of inexhaustible terrain of interpretation. You know, at the end of every match, you can have seemingly endless conversations with other people about what happened, what should have happened, what might have happened. Um, in that sense, you know, that's all part of uh, 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 and the suspicion that somehow some people are getting treated better than others um, is always there. As is the suspicion that the money in the sport, uh, you know, pushes. Uh, pushes some some decisions. In other words, people want to have the big stars playing. Um, there's a, the famous case of the 1998 World Cup when Ronaldo, who was not feeling very well, who'd had a, a you know a, a serious health problem that day, the day of the final, nevertheless played. And there's actually was an inquiry in Brazil about whether he had been put on the field by, with pressure from Nike, which had a, an endorsement contract with him. Um, Nike, of course, denies this. Ronaldo den denies this. But just it's an example of the fact that actually governments have themselves had inquiries into into aspects of, of the World Cup um, long after the fact. So there's a sense in which um, p governments do really get involved in this. And in the last few weeks, we've seen several governments and government officials speak about what has happened on the football field. This is a terrain that's incredibly political, and, and, and government officials feel like they have a right in some ways to, to intervene and, and talk about what's going on. Um, they're actually right now showing the replay of the, of the, uh, the play that got France into the uh, World Cup with the, the handball that's being shown. So this is obviously kind of one of the one of the big issues that's going to be talked about today. President Dubois, in fact, along the lines of government intervention, you had a recent blog post about the Argentinian government Mm -hmm. Guarantees the right to football. Mm -hmm. What's that story? Well, I was. Uh, it's a you know a bit of a of a joke in some ways, not where, but a, a sort of serious point, which is that Argentina, you know, throughout the world, the question of who, of who gets to watch football is increasingly uh, an important one. Um, as more and more of the media becomes paying media, in other words, as as access to football matches becomes either a fact of having cable or pay per view, um, that obviously excludes people in a lot of the world. People can't afford necessarily those services, and so Argentina. The Argentinian government actually negotiated directly with the Argentine Football Federation um, and basically bought the contract for uh, local football matches in Argentina so that they would be shown for free on on national television. Um, and in a sense, they very were, were kind of the, the reason I say they guaranteed a right to football is in a sense that the, the decision was a way of asserting that Argentinian citizens had a right to watch football and shouldn't have to pay for it. Um, Obviously, uh, this is a question that comes up a lot around the World Cup. You know, who, who, how should people have access? How are people going to have access? How are people in South Africa or other African countries going to have access? Will they be able to watch the games? And there's obviously a huge amount of money involved in uh, in those the rights for for airing these these games throughout the world um, at rights that FIFA FIFA controls and sells. Um, so the whole question of of access of access to these games is really important. Um, in the Argentinian case, it's also this other larger question about how leagues in places like Argentina or Africa do, especially in a context where so much it is, uh, uh, so many of the good, great players and so, many, so much attention uh, goes towards European teams. Um, and so there's a question of also about how local leagues throughout the world are in some ways you know, at, at, in, in, a, in, a, in a difficult situation with regards to Europe. Everyone watching is invited to jump into the conversation by Facebook, by Twitter, or by email. Now, Professor Dubois, talking broadly about the 2010 World Cup in South Africa, what are the politics at stake here? Obviously, it's the first World Cup hosted by an African country. That's important. But just big picture, what what's the international significance of this World Cup? Well, it's really within the history. I mean, I think there, there's so many different angles to the politics of it. Within the history of, of soccer or football itself, um, it is really crucial. I mean, Africa has been an incredibly important site for the development of soccer. There's a historian, Peter Alleghi, who's publishing a book called African Soccerscapes um, next year, which really makes a strong case for the way in which Africa has sort of shaped, shaped the game. Um, it is, of course, today an incredibly important site for the game. At the same time, Africa has had um, a very difficult relationship with FIFA, or the Confederation, the African Football Confederation, has had a difficult relationship with FIFA, going back to the early years of the World Cup. Actually, 1966, African nations boycotted the World Cup because at the time there were 16 slots, and there was only one slot that was either for an Asian or an African team. In other words, an African team, either an African or an Asian team, had, could get into the World Cup. Kwame Nkrumah actually led a boycott in 1966, which led to a few more spots in the World Cup. Still today, Africa has five slots in this World Cup and an additional one guaranteed for South Africa as the host. Europe has 13 slots. 
Um, both of those, the, the African and European continents, both have 53 teams competing for the World Cup, which means that it's two times more likely for a European team than an African team to get in, roughly. Um, so there's still a way in which the kind of inequalities or, of access are there. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for that, and it's, it's not to say that that needs to be immediately changed, but it's something to, to think about. Um, so the symbolic point about having, having this World Cup in Africa is extremely important. And it's really the culmination of a long effort that goes back to the election of Havelange as president of FIFA um, when he basically got elected to president of FIFA, Havelange is a Brazilian, got elected as president of FIFA in, in part precisely by reaching out to African and Asian nations and, and insisting that he would work to make them uh, more included in FIFA. Um, and this is a kind of culmination of that whole effort to have this African World Cup. So. Um, within the history of FIFA and football, it's a very important um, date. It's a very important thing also for, for I think, the African continent. Um, it is an opportunity for South Africa, as many people have reminded us, to, to sort of um, show itself to the world. And uh, there's a lot of kind of attention and, and uh, placed on that, on you know, what impression are people going to have of South Africa? How is the World Cup going to come off? Within South Africa, of course, it's also a zone of great tension. You know, South Africa has to bear the costs, has borne the costs of building these stadiums. And there's a lot of debate and struggle within South Africa about you know, how that money's been spent What's the ultimate impact going to be? Are there more pressing priorities that should have been addressed uh, with the enormous financial investment uh, that goes into building stadiums and so forth? So um, now at the same time, there's just a larger global political situation, which is that every team that goes to the World Cup in some ways will also bring national hopes, will um, you know, in some ways be in relationship with their own nations and politics that are going on there. So you've got a real potent mix of, of politics and sport here. In talking about World Cup and uh, geopolitical symbolism. I think it's hard to forget last year's World Cup in Zidane Zidane's headbutt mm -hmm. of Marco Materazzi. Right. So uh, talk about that just in, in terms of how that sets us up for uh, 2010. Is that mm -hmm. still reverberating? Well, I think in some ways it's, I mean, I think it's it's certainly a memorable moment. It's probably, you know, less present than it was. I mean, the discussion around it quite, was was incredible. In my book, I actually devote quite a lot of attention to all the discussion of that. The book, in fact, a lot of the book is woven around the story of, of Zidane and then Thuram, Lilian Thuram, another uh, player on the French team who was actually here at Duke a few weeks ago. Um, so the Zidane headbutt is kind of one of these incredible moments in the, in the history of sport that... Um, I think how to think about it is, is very is very complex. I mean, the, the basic the first basic point is that, as I say, I mean, in the, in the book, this is the largest stage that's ever existed in, in world history. I mean, the World Cup, it's just there's never been that many people watching something at this at, at one moment. So three billion people were watching and three billion people saw the headbutt, which means that a large number of those people really had kind of strong opinions about it. They debated it. It raised all kinds of issues about, uh, you know, what he had done, should he have done it, what it mean that it, that he had done it, and so forth. Um, so it was this kind of global event through one act on the on the soccer field. Um, there's obviously uh, reactions in France. There were reactions in Algeria. There were reactions in the U.S. All of those are are different, and it's a kind of really interesting cultural moment where you have a really a, so much shared around one one event on on a field. Um, is, is really kind of remarkable. So, um, I mean, you can still go on the web and you'll find many, many different forms of commentary about it. Um, and uh, I think that it's interesting in part because it raises an issue. In a sense, it's, a, it's not exactly the same issue as was raised with the, the handball, but it's an issue about uh, the ethics of the sport, about how, how athletes should act on the field, and also about the kind of intersections between what goes on off the field and on the field. Um, you know, what are the larger political context uh, issues about um, insults, which of course were at the core of that discussion, um, and larger questions about about race and so forth that 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 arose out of that discussion. Since even though Zidane uh, never never said that there were racist uh, racist words said by Materazzi, many people thought that there had been or assumed that there had been. Um, so that was part of the discussion as well. Um, we're seeing, uh, I'm seeing lots of images of South Africa, and there's a kind of, of course, a whole interesting campaign um, going on to sort of present and welcome people to South Africa, which is which is a really important part of this process. So. Professor Dubois, you just mentioned your book, and not only Zidane, but Lilian Turam, maybe mm -hmm. a name that's not quite as world famous, but yet someone you think who's symbolically important that helps tell the story of World Cup and world history. Why did you choose mm -hmm. him to be a, a, a centerpiece in your book? Mm -hmm. 
Well, he is a, a figure whom he's a defender on the field, so he always got a, you know he got a little bit less attention, obviously, than strikers do. Although his role on the French team was really as essential um, in, in many ways. I mean, there are other other very important players too. Um, Turam for me was also really interesting because I think he you can probably say he's probably the most politicized uh, soccer player in the world, maybe even the most politicized athlete. And by which I mean that um, not he not only participates in kind of anti-racist campaigns within the sport, but he's been very vocal and public about political issues. Um, in a sort of intense criticism of the French president, speaking up on behalf of immigrants, taking some very bold actions um, within France. At one point, he and Patrick Vieira sort of invited uh, a group of undocumented immigrants, sans papier, who had been uh, who had been protesting um, to come watch a game. Um, so he's been really. Uh, very political in a way that, that very few athletes actually are today. There was a kind of earlier generation of athletes we know of in the United States who, who were in that mold in some ways. Um, so I think he's really interesting because he's someone who has very specifically sought to use the prominence he gained as a representative for France, as a um, as a black Frenchman, as a, as a person of Caribbean background who grew up in a, in a project south of Paris and who sort of speaks on behalf of, of disenfranchised people in France. Um, but he's also spoken in a very complicated and interesting ways about race in France and um, republicanism in France. And he has a very uh, you know, interesting political philosophy that's, that, that kind of he articulates. So he's kind of a remarkable figure. Um, and he contrasts with Zidane in the sense that Zidane has been relatively laconic. Zidane does not take that many public stances. Um, he's very rarely intervened in politics in direct ways. Um, in fact, he doesn't really like to speak that much in public so much. Um, so they're, they're a nice contrast, um, but they share a story um, that, that links them together. Um, in the book, they also help me tell the whole story of, of French empire, both in the Caribbean and North Africa, and of football in those, in those two places, which have been crucial zones um, in the history of football. So. Everyone watching is invited to ask Professor Dubois a question. You may also be watching the World Cup draw. Uh, to ask Professor Dubois a question, post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. Professor Dubois, we're into talking about your book, Soccer Empire, and you were just getting into it here, but this telling the story of European history and especially French modern history through the lens of soccer in the World Cup What's the narrative you're putting forward here? I, it may be hard to summarize, but mm -hmm. how would you get into it? Well, it's really about, um, I mean, I, I was interested when I began the book, I ran the book really after the Zidane headbutt, and originally the book was really meant to be, to just explore a, a smaller question, which was how contemporary soccer in France has become probably the major site through which the question of the history of empire is discussed. Because anyone who follows football knows that the French team is a majority, the majority of players on the French team are of either African, Caribbean, or North African background. Uh, that was the case in 2006. It was, it's still the case today. Um, so it's a team in which the kind of whole history of empire and the migration, post-colonial migration to France is really put on, you know, amply put on display. And there's no way to kind of avoid thinking about what that history means and what it means for these players to be there. Um, so it was that that's what originally drew me to the topic. And then when I realized, as doing, doing research on it, how incredibly important football actually was throughout the history of the French Empire, how rapidly it became an important zone in Algeria for political conflict and expressions of, of identity. And, and, and it was a very, very important part in Algerian history. In the Caribbean, too, it's been a very, very important site for, for kind of people to articulate who they are in relationship to the French state and in relationship to other kinds of identities. Um, so it's, it's a story that allows you to actually really think about the whole history of, of these very large issues about empire um, with a thread, I think. So my, my, my hope was to tell a story that's biographical, that tells stories of different parts of the French Empire, and then also just illuminates how sport and politics kind of interact in one context and then also more broadly. Um, because I really also wanted to use a specific example, but make also a broader point about um, what football is and, and why it's become so important in the world. And, and this is one version of that story. In a way, it could be told in a lot of other places too, um, and has been told by historians writing about South Africa or England or Latin American countries as well. So. Professor Dubois, along those lines, you co-hosted a conference here at Duke on race, sport, and power. So as you're at a conference like that and you're hearing American colleagues talk about those same issues, what are you learning? Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, we that was a really interesting conference in which we one of the things we tried to do was to di put in dialogue issues about race and sports in the U.S. with uh, with those in Europe and Africa in particular. Um, and we had a panel really about sport in Africa. Um, so I think you know one of the things that's so interesting is it shows up in some ways the uniqueness of the American system because Amer the United States is one of the few places, really one of the only places. I mean, there's a few other countries that do this in, in some way too, um, in which uh, universities and athletic and professional athletics are so linked together, right? In which the pathway to professional sports goes through the university largely. Um, that's a kind of very unique system that developed in the United States. In most other places, in France, for instance, basically people take one or the other track. People at a very young age in France, for instance, might decide to go into a football academy. They would finish high school, um, but they would already be very much in a track that's towards professional athletics and not, and, and there wouldn't be that much, they, they would very likely not go to the university. Um, so that's one thing, is that the, the configuration in which these things take shape is so different. Um, and at the same time, the, just the whole language about race, um, issues about race and the way they're dealt with in the media, all those things are really different. I mean, I think in some ways what we learned from the conference would that it'd be very, it would be very interesting to have much more sustained um, comparative discussions um, about this because it just it opened up so many interesting questions, at least to my mind. Professor Dubois, we have about 275 people participating in this Office Hours conversation. Everyone watching is invited to join the conversation by asking a question. You can do that on Facebook, by Twitter, or by email. Now, Professor Dubois, we are here, and uh, I think we can say that we've got the World Cup draw coverage up on uh, ESPN. Uh, that's, of course, an American uh, media outlet. So what about this uh, soccer coming to America? It's a perennial question, but how mm -hmm. come the rest of the world is soccer crazy and, and the U.S. seems somewhat inoculated? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an interesting question. I'm actually going to writing an op-ed that will come out next week in the Herald here in Durham about this particular question. And, um, you know, I think it's it's very con contradictory in some ways. I think soccer is incredibly embedded in American society. In fact, I might hazard, I don't know if, you know, we could prove this, but I think probably more people play soccer in a kind of leisure or, or you know, as children in this society than any other single sport. You know, it's a sport that's incredibly widespread. You drive around Durham or anywhere else on Saturday, you're going to see a lot of soccer being played informally or formally. Um, so it's a sport that certainly has a place in American society. Um, it's long been a sport that's been very important and played in immigrant communities, and that's still the case. There's a great book um, by Paul Quadros about um, forming a team in Siler City, North Carolina, uh, that was mainly Mexican players and how that kind of played out in, in one North Carolina time, time, uh, town recently. Um, so there's a kind of association, I think, sometimes with, with arrivals or with people who are bringing the sport. And I mean, one way we talked about it in class is that it sometimes seems as if soccer's always arriving in the United States and never fully at home. You know, it always seems like it's not exactly at home here, even though it's been here for 100 years and been a very important part of our society. Um, I think things are changing quite a bit now um, in the sense that, first of all, a lot of younger people follow, very closely follow European soccer. When we, uh, when Lily Antram was here, we went to the Durham School of the Arts and, um, you know, there was like a huge, I mean, a massive throng of students crowding around him, uh, getting their, their jerseys signed, people with Juventus jerseys and Barca jerseys. It was clear that they were, you know, they were really, they were familiar with who he was and, and extremely excited to meet uh, someone that, that they idolized. So there was a, there's a way in which, um, I think a lot of people in the United States are actually tapped into this larger global soccer culture. Um, at the same time, we have a sports culture that's already very full. You know, there's a lot of different sports um, and a lot of scholars just talk about soccer being in some ways crowded out or having difficulty finding space within the professional sphere of athletics. Um, you might say that there are some deeper differences or there are things about soccer that do uh, cause resistance. I mean, the kinds of things that people, in fact, when there are complaints about soccer in the United States, people point to, you know, the fact that it's a low scoring game, the fact that there seems to be this theatricality to it, that, that referees calls are so important and people, you know, there's diving and there's sorts of things that, that go on that um, some people don't like. And the fact that it's also um, so low scoring suggests a certain kind of, I don't know, there's a, there's a difficulty for some people about dealing with that as a, as a sport. Um, the fact that it never stops, you know, which for many fans is precisely Precisely what makes it so great uh, for others is, is is less enjoyable. So I think there are issues about that. It's interesting in my class we discuss this consistently with the students um, and a lot of different you know points of view about it. Um, 
we talked about, for instance, the question of statistics and uh, sports coverage in the United States often, you know, t relies on or, or really makes a lot out of statistics. Depends on the sport, but certainly in baseball and other sports. Um, and it's always interesting that soccer uh, statistics are a, a little useful in soccer. It's not that they are never useful. It's useful to know possession statistics and so forth. But it's really hard to make much of a correlation between statistics and the outcomes of games um, or players. It's very hard to really define a player. Um, according to statistics. So there's a kind of, there's sort of different cultures, I think, of sports coverage and even just talking about sports um, that maybe make, you know, for some some difficulties here. But um, I think, so there's all, all those features that play a role in why soccer is not as, as popular here. Um, although, again, I think we can also sometimes overestimate or kind of over-exaggerate. I think maybe within the sports media, there's a certain amount of, you know, you, you get jokes about it or, 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 or not familiarity with it. But I also feel like kind of in the population as a whole, there's at least lots and lots of pockets or a very strong subculture of, of intense soccer fandom that's, that's around. Professor Dubois, we are monitoring the World Cup draw coverage here, as you know, and uh, we're seeing on the FIFA website that it looks like the actual selections they're holding till the end of the hour, another 20 minutes. Oh, okay. And, um, but continuing the conversation here about soccer outside of big stadiums. You say that in the U.S. that um, soccer does get played by many people, but it just doesn't necessarily receive a lot of attention. And along those lines, a project that you've been supportive of is a documentary by some Duke alumni, mm. uh, now called Paleta, it was called The Soccer Project, that takes a look at the influence of soccer outside big stadiums. So what's your take on this cultural role of informal pickup soccer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great film. I mean, I was supportive only in the sense that we did a screening of it this fall. I mean, the, really, a lot of a lot of Duke people have been involved in that. Um, three of the filmmakers are Duke alums. They got their start at the Center for Documentary Studies. You know, it's been great in uh, in supporting their work. They got help from the provost, and and they began the film as undergraduates here. Really exciting film, and when it really when it's released, I hope we'll have another screening here. Um, we saw a work in project progress version of it earlier. Um, it shows a lot that film because what it what basically what the students did is they embarked on a journey. Um, one uh, Gwendolyn uh, Oxenham, who was a prof who was a soccer player here at Duke on the women's team, um, kind of realized at that point there wasn't a women's league here, and and, and the, the film is revolves around her realization that she's not going to be able to really continue to do what she loves most, which is to play soccer, you know, professionally in the United States. Um, and so they travel around the world and just play these pickup games, and it's just a, a beautiful film in the sense that everywhere they go, I mean, they kind of. You know, bribe their way into a Bolivian prison. They go to the salt flats in Bolivia. They go into you know all kinds of neighborhoods in Argentina that they're warned not to go into, and so forth. And everywhere they go, they are able to communicate with the sport. Um, and the sport kind of provides a kind of. They really shows how the sport is a kind of almost a universal language. I think, you know, it may be the most universal language that we have on the planet today. The thing that travels the most that you can you can travel with the most. So that's part of what they show, um, and just the joy in which a lot of, you know, people take in the sport. People, they, they play with some waiters, you know, who when they get off their shifts at midnight, go out and play for a couple hours. Um, they play with, in Japan, with, with you know, guys who are in offices all day, and in the evening they go and play on these tiny rooftops, um, and so forth. They play with Iranian women. So there's a, there's a way in which it shows that, you know, beyond the kind of big lights, as they say, beyond the kind of professional sport, there's just this kind of game. And I think um, it plays a role in, in people's enjoyment of soccer. It, I think it makes a difference if you've played a game, no matter how bad you are, like, you know, for, like a lot of us, like me, in, in other words, in other words, if you're, you, you, you've played something and then you watch it, there's a relationship to what's going on in the field um, and you can kind of enjoy it and imagine it in a slightly different way. So the fact that so many fans are also players um, in one way or another, I think does play a role. Um, and uh, that may be true in other games as well, but obviously it, I think in soccer it's particularly strong. So, um, this is Office Hours at Duke University. Today, we're talking with Professor Laurent Dubois about the politics of soccer. You're invited to jump into the conversation by asking a question, posting a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweeting with the tag Duke Live, or emailing live at duke.edu. Professor Dubois, you mentioned that you said you're, you're a so-so soccer player yourself. <laughs> so, so what's your personal passion here? What, right. uh, what's your a connection to what the rest of the world calls football. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I really enjoy playing and played as a kid. Uh, and so um, it, it's something that has been part of my life for a long time. But it's also that um, 
I mean, I think I as there's the side of just personal enjoyment in it, and then there's some as a kind of historian and someone who looks at culture. Um, I just find this a really intellectually exciting uh, thing to look at. I mean, it's just so, of such importance um, in the world today, and it tells us so much about different societies and about the larger society in which we live. So there's a you know a combination of just enjoyment. I mean, I I, I love the game and I love to to watch the game, but I also find it to be um, really intellectually uh, important and stimulating to to think about it. Um, and I find that it's just a way to to get into so many different issues um, and to look at the, the links between kind of people's passions and people's joy and, and, and you know, the way that community is, is created through these kinds of events and then larger political and economic and social structures. Um, so I guess both sides, you know, for me, I, it kind of pulls together both the kind of personal interests and, and intellectual interests in a, in a way. So. so when you're watching a soccer game on, say, a, a satellite channel, what are you seeing or looking for that maybe someone with a bag of chips is not looking for? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I always love to see how, I mean, I just feel like every soccer game is a kind of amazing story that lays out. And it could be, you know, any almost any game. You can tune into a, a league game in Turkey or someplace or, or um, whatever whatever it is. Um, you can go see a pickup game or a great the great, you know, college games, go see a Duke game. Um, there's a way in which you can kind of at the beginning of a game, you just don't know what to expect. And you can kind of see a story unfold when you watch those games. You might see the way that a team either coalesces or works together on the field. And it's such a psychological game. It's a game in which the players have such a burden. Um, I mean, a coach, you know, a, a soccer coach essentially kind of has to sit there during most of the game, right? They can decide who to bring in and out. They can talk to their, their they can prepare their team. They can talk to them at halftime. Otherwise, it's sort of up to the players to figure out what is going on on the field and to see that happen and to watch either you know you can from from something turning really bad or disastrous you know uh, to to a team really pulling together is exciting um, to watch and there's always I mean I think in any context the more you know about the larger context of where a team's coming from who the players are what the rivalries are what's going on in the place where it's taking place you can really see different layers going on in a game and I think that kind of reading is is fun I mean it's the kind of reading you know you might do for a film or a or a, or a play or something um, but you can the, because it's happening in real time, because it keeps happening, because you just know that every week, every month, there's going to be more of this drama take shape, and it's always going to be surprising. Um, so I think that's something to just enjoy about the sport, you know, that, that the, the way in which what happens on the field is, you know, linked up to these larger, larger social issues, I think gives it a lot of energy, you know, and provides a lot of energy. That's, of course, it's true for club teams in, in different places. Um, and it's, of course, true in an international competition where um, the way I say it in the book is that in some ways, a place like France or Germany, I mean, the nation, the French nation doesn't really exist, doesn't take form symbolically, at least any time except during these big World Cup competitions. I mean, that's when suddenly, you know, the uh, you can look at a team and say, that's France. They're, they're, they're playing for France. They're, France is going to win or France is going to lose. And there's a way in which um, that's very powerful. Um, and it's something that, that, you know, then affects how people see who they are and raises all kinds of questions about who they are, who the team is, and who they are, therefore, in relationship to the team. Professor Dubois, we have about 350 people participating in this Office Hours conversation, and everyone is invited to ask a question. To do that, post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. We've got an email question here that comes from Jeffrey, and he asks, the governments of Egypt and Algeria are now having a war of words coming out of attack on Egyptian fans following a World Cup qualifier in November. Is soccer in the Arab world usually that heated? And considering the sport came to the region during the period of European dominance, why is it that the game of the colonizer remains so popular after the colonizers mm -hmm. left? Mm -hmm. This is a great question. I mean, both Algeria and Egypt are countries that very early got heavily into football. In fact, Egypt um, was one of the earlier members of FIFA. They played in the Olympics before there was a World Cup. So Egypt actually has a very long, illustrious history in, in football and one of the first to really kind of, you know, non-European nations to play. Uh, in many of these competitions. Um, Algeria, meanwhile, of course, was a French colony. And very early in the 1920s, by the 1920s in Algeria, there were not only football clubs among the colonial settlers, among French and, and, and people from other parts of Europe who lived there, but also very quickly among um, sort of native Algerians. And in fact, many of the clubs actually used the colors of Islam and the symbols of Islam that would later, and names uh, related to Islam, that would later become kind of a basis for, for nationalist symbols in Algeria. So um, actually, in Algeria, notably, both, I mean, in Egypt, it's a slightly, it's a linked story, but in different terms. But in Algeria, 
football was very strong vehicle for actually anti-colonial activism. And in fact, during the Algerian Revolution, um, a group of footballers who are very well known professional footballers playing in France who are from Algeria actually left France. Uh, two of them were supposed to play in the World Cup for France in 1958. They left France and created an Algerian national team. Um, so there was an Algerian national team before there was an Algerian nation. And the idea was, in a sense, they became diplomats and representatives for the revolution. Um, so in a sense, I think there and throughout Africa, even though it was a game that was brought by Europeans, um, it very quickly became something people considered to be really theirs um, and even a, a great vehicle for challenging Europeans. Um, and we read a lot of material in the class about particular cases of that. Um, so uh, at the same time, of course, today, it is a vehicle, very much a vehicle for governments to try to, I mean, in the, the Egyptian and Algerian governments both try to use their football teams to mobilize national support. In this case, this was a hotly contested match, you know, a defining match that would determine who went to the World Cup. So the qualifying match was very important. Um, it was an old rivalry. Egypt and Algeria have had many intense games. Um, and it's interesting, though, how quickly the governments got directly involved in kind of accusing uh, the other government of certain things, diplomats recalled and so forth. So it really shows that, um, you know, state officials think of football as really part of what, you know, they're involved in. And they, they, they feel like they can speak to it um, and, and, in, and integrate themselves into it. Um, football, I'll just say in the Middle East this summer, before I, this is how we, we began the course in Iran. The Iranian team, in the midst of the the, uh, the protests that followed um, the election in June, wore green armbands, which were the symbol of the uh, of of the protest movement in Iran, the, the green movement or the green revolution. They wore green armbands during a game against Korea. Um, one of them, in particular, the captain Makhtavipia, is a great hero of, of Iranian football. Had scored a winning goal against the U.S. in 1998, um, and that was a very clear kind of protest on their part. And several of them were were punished upon returning. To to Iran for having taken that stance. Um, so there's there's ways in which it is very very political in the Middle East uh, as it is in a lot of other places. But there's a particular history there that's that's really interesting and important um, to look at. And I think you know it's something again in the future. This will be a place where um, we'll see a lot of of activity and political activity around football in in the Middle East, no doubt. Um, we watched just one more point in that we watched a great film called Offside, which is about Iranian women uh, who are often banned from going to certain games in Iran or football games in Iran. And it's a great film about their desire to go to the games um, and what happens around that. Professor Dubois, you mentioned uh, Arab teams and uh, Islam. Does faith come up in addition to politics when you're looking at soccer, Christian players not playing on Sundays, Muslim players fasting during Ramadan, the team prayers? Is that uh, something that comes up in your research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of religious, first of all, just demonstrations on fields. You know, I mean, you see a lot of players who pray uh, in one way or another before games, uh, after goals, you know, who thank God for a goal. Um, there's many, many sequences. You know, I'm thinking of different players from from Brazil in the 70s and even in today will often, you know, sometimes have T-shirts that sort of thank, um, thank, uh, thanks Jesus or, or, or so forth. So there's, there's a lot of players um, who obviously, you know, when they enter the field kind of call on, on, on their spiritual powers to, to help them. Um, that's something that I think is, you know, it is in a sense a very intense uh, space in which people call on, 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 on what they believe will help them. Uh, so it's, it's there all the time. I think, um, and uh, there's also player, you know, there's all kinds of other ways players prepare for a game um, as well. At the same time, it can be a place for people to broadcast, you know, what th their beliefs as well. And I mean, whether they're political beliefs or religious beliefs. So players um, often, you know, they they feel like in some ways, I think a certain number of players feel like they have a kind of responsibility that the world is watching them, and they they can relay messages either just through their behavior or or, or but also sometimes literally on the field itself through through uh, symbols that they have or um, or shirts that they're wearing or, or those sorts of things. Um, so you do see this uh, as a very prevalent part of, of, of football. Professor Dubois, we'd been talking earlier about soccer in the U.S. And so I think it's hard to speak about that without talking about David Beckham coming to play for the Los mm -hmm. Angeles Galaxy. Anything political about this or is it just business? Um, well, you know, it's business and politics at the same time. I mean, I think there, it's part of a long history that goes back to the New York cosmos in the 1970s. And there's a great film about that called uh, 
um, the, the once in a lifetime that's about this earlier effort, the national, the NASL soccer league. There's been, you know, a long time coming this idea that if they could, if we could, if you could bring big such big stars uh, who had, a, you know, global reputations to play in the United States, that would help draw crowds and it would make professional soccer work in the United States. Um, they did that with Pele in the 1970s and it worked for a while. It didn't end up creating a long term uh, professional soccer league, but it led to all kinds of other things in the U.S. So Beckham's arrival, I think, is important. Um, in in a way, it draws attention. As are, I mean, as important are the kind of games where you know Barcelona comes to play uh, in the United States, and a lot of people come out for those games. It's very important, obviously, because if they can increase the number of people who go to games through through events like that, then they might get a more solid audience overall. I mean, I would say that today in the West Coast, it seems like you know there's some very very successful teams in Seattle and LA with really good gate receipts. A lot of people going. You watch the games; it looks like you know there's a huge fan base. There are fan organizations and so forth. Um, and I think uh, that's something that if it can kind of spill out beyond it, I mean, obviously, it's always something to kind of to easy to make fun of in a way, since after all, um, you know, people like people point out that Beckham comes here only when he's done playing in Europe, right? It's sort of where soccer soccer stars retire. Um, so there's a kind of way in which it's obviously it means that the U.S. isn't at the center of the soccer, uh, the professional soccer world. But um, it's also a way to draw people's attention. And, and of course, you know, I, soccer idols are, are always a draw for people. So, Professor Dubois, FIFA tells us we're about five minutes away from the draw here. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we're uh, getting close. So particularly for people who uh, are joining us, set the scene here. Cape Town, South Africa and What's at stake? Um, what are we going to see and what's the significance? Mm -hmm. Well, what we're going to see is, is uh, Charlize Theron and other people drawing lots from, from, from pools. And what they're going to determine is there are going to be eight groups um, at the beginning of the World Cup. There's going to be four teams in each one. Those teams will all play each other, so each team will, will play three other opponents. Um, and at the end of those that that part of the World Cup, two teams will go on. So what we're going to figure out today, finally, is uh, we're going to know exactly what teams are going to play each other in the first round. For fans or people who are planning to go to the World Cup, they're finally going to be able to figure out where they're going to need to go to support their team, where the game's going to take place. Um, that's something until now you haven't been able to, to predict for sure. Um, we're going to figure out, are there going to be very exciting matchups in the first round? You know, there's matchups with political significance. A lot of people are, are kind of hoping there might be a France-Algeria game. There's a long and complicated history about France-Algeria matchups um, in a, a 2001 game that actually was interrupted because of a pitch invasion in France, so the game was never completed. Um, so there's things like that. You know, are there going to be particular matchups that we can look forward to in the first round? Um, is going to be crucial. And then if you're a fan of a particular team, of course, it really the fate of the team in some ways hangs in the balance. If you if maybe a, a team that that is maybe a little weaker, it gets into a group with very difficult teams. Um, the chance of moving on to the next round is substantially diminished. On the other hand, if it's a, a, a group that they can imagine getting out of, suddenly, you know, it's imaginable that you'll go into the round of 16 and maybe move on. So um, people from this day on will be able to really start making some predictions and kind of try to imagine uh, where teams will end up and, and how it'll go for them. We have about 400 viewers watching here this office hour session, and everyone watching is invited to ask Professor Laurent Dubois here at Duke a question. To do that, post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. Professor Dubois, as we're now just minutes away from the World Cup draw, you were talking about some potential matchups. I mean, any other ones that could be particularly politically significant? What about a a North Korea, USA, or a Serbia, Slovenia. I mean, what, mm -hmm. uh, what, what could cause some sparks? Right. I mean, there's some of those that will be difficult to see. You know, there's there's limitations on how many European teams can be in each in each pool, and there's a, a set of seeds of eight seeds. So. Um, Obviously, you can imagine a U.S.-North Korea game. I mean, there's been in the past, you know, Iran is not in this World Cup, but um, but there's been in the past U.S.-Iran games that have involved a lot of uh, discussion about the politics of the game beforehand and during it. Um, I mean, I think it's really interesting because if you go back even to the origins of the World Cup, Jules Rimet was a World War One veteran. He was interested in kind of international peace and supporting international peace. And um, as much as, uh, you know, you can think of sometimes this sport as a kind of war, um, between two sides. It's also really something totally different than a war in the sense that people agree on a set of rules. There's a certain kind of respect there's on the field. So 
at once. If two teams play against each other, obviously it can kind of raise a specter of conflict. And at the same time, it means that the two teams have kind of agreed to play each other within a certain context in a certain way. So it can also be a kind of gesture even of, of pacification or peace of relationships. Um, and sports have been used sometimes to open up relationships as opposed to. So there's a way in which um, you know, France-Algeria one is an interesting one because but there's been a long history of people really wanting to have a France-Algeria game work as a kind of sign of of putting putting the past behind of, of of you know kind of getting beyond the very brutal Algerian War of Independence and all all the kind of ghosts that go with with that story. Um, so you know you you have those kinds of cases. You also just have other big rivalries. Um, and of course you can think about the players on different teams and who's going to confront who on the field. Um, so all those are kind of significant. I think a lot of people, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's a big question. You know, this would be a, a, a wonderful World Cup for African teams, obviously, to shine in. Um, there are five African teams plus South Africa and some very exciting, strong teams. So in the groups, you know, the question of which groups the Algerian team or the Ivory Coast team or the Cameroon team ends up in will be pretty important to see whether, you know, we can think uh, how, how, how good their chances might be of going on at least into the round of 16 and hopefully further from there. Um, so that's something I'll be looking for. Professor Dubois, you just mentioned that uh, the World Cup in a way was envisioned as, as a kind of um, a diplomatic way for nations to come together much in the way that the Olympics has been uh, talked of. So what about that comparison between Olympics and World Cup? Mm -hmm. I mean, they really come out of some of the same... Um, some same ideas and then really the same period in fact both they're both French uh, inventions in fact or in some ways Pierre de Coubertin who, who kind of invented the modern Olympics and Jules Rimet um, and who, who were you know sent uh, contemporaries um, and both had were part of a larger world in which uh, there was an attempt to create international institutions and so forth um, one of the criticisms that Rimet made of the Olympics is that the amateur ethic as far as he was concerned made it a much more elitist event in other words at a time when professional sports were taking off to have an event that was predicated on amateur participation essentially meant that the kind of people, you know, uh, more popular classes who were really making a living out of sports would be excluded. He saw the World Cup as actually a more popular and kind of, um, you know, broader with a broader constituency. So that's kind of interesting in the sense that they conceived of them a little bit differently. They're obviously both um, global, massive global sports events. I mean, the difference I think is simply the the concentration of the World Cup, right? Uh, the the Olymp the Olympics have many different competitions, and some of them. And the kind of big question is how many medals each country has gotten. Or you know, there's some games obviously that are very crucial, but it's a diffuse competition. Uh, the World Cup gets extremely concentrated, especially once you get into the elimination rounds. You know, you have one game. At the end of that game, one team is going to be gone and one team is going on. Um, and, of course, the final is that way, too. So that's why um, it is, in a sense, a, something like the World Cup final itself uh, as one event, 90 minutes in which everything is determined, um, has a kind of drama that, that is different from what happens with the Olympics where people follow different sorts of events. Um, so I think they both have a kind of, uh, they, don't, they both have a political purpose, of course, in that they put nations in, in relationship to one another. And politics is always part of the Olympics, too. Um, so they're very you know, similar in that way, but there's also a, a different kind of drama and theatricality to the to the two events, I think. Professor Dubois, if you take a moment to glance at the screen here in the studio, it looks mm -hmm. like the uh, pageantry for the draw has begun, and you've spoken of the draw in the World Cup more broadly as a world stage, and mm -hmm. you're seeing hundreds of millions of people viewing. So South Africa is, is obviously taking its uh, chance here to highlight its culture. Mm -hmm. So what about this uh, intersection of, of sports and culture that we're seeing one example played out uh, right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, South Africa is going to really, you know, this is an opportunity to put themselves out, you know, to sort of celebrate their culture. South Africa, of course, the history of sport in South Africa is, is a very intense one. And, and this is a very important uh, event for South Africa itself. South Africa, of course, uh, under apartheid, this, the, the, the African Football Confederation banned, um, banned South Africa from playing because South Africa refused to send integrated teams. They refused to send teams with both whites and, and blacks playing together. Um, and so they were not allowed to play in the African Nations Cup and CAF succeeded in having FIFA ban them as well. So South Africa played, it was, you know, was, was, was out of the World Cup for many, for, for a long time as a result of its apartheid policies. Since 1994, since the end of apartheid, it has of course been included and they've fielded uh, interracial teams. The teams have been really a symbol 
both through victories in South Africa and and elsewhere of of this kind of new South Africa. So that's an exciting story. Of course, football was also a really important part in the anti-apartheid struggle. We'll be having an event this spring with a film about um, about the way in which football was part of of life in Robben Island, which is where a lot of the political prisoners, including uh, Mandela, were housed. And so there's a way in which I mean, this game and politics have always been uh, tightly linked in South Africa. And again, Peter Alegi is a historian who's written uh, quite a bit about that. So. So um, that's part of it. And then there's a kind of broader appeal, which is basically to, to reach out to the world and say South Africa is a great destination. We have this exciting history, this culture um, to kind of encourage people to come to the World Cup. And I obviously I think there's hopes that 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 this will also engender more tourism and more investment down the road. That's one of the big gamble um, that South Africa is taking and in investing a ton of money in to the, building the infrastructure so that in the long term it may also have a different kind of image worldwide um, as well. And that's obviously, I think, part of the part of the pageantry of this and the event itself will be around that. So we're seeing some of the beginnings of the uh, of the of the draw. I think they're, of course, drawing it out. But <laughs> yes, we, we've got about uh, 400 viewers here with us and everyone is welcome to post a comment or a question here, for Professor Dubois, as we watch the World Cup draw. You can do that by posting a comment on the Duke University Facebook page by tweeting with the tag Duke Live, or you can email live at duke.edu. You can send us uh, your hopes, your wishes for the draw. Now, Professor Dubois, for us Americans, uh, guide us here. If we're hoping that the U.S. has a chance to get past this first round, uh, what are some of the teams that you'd hope that the U.S. would play? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good question. I mean, again, soccer is so unpredictable. It's hard to know uh, what would be the best outcome. Um, you know, there's obviously some European teams that that are in the that are in there that are probably weaker. Uh, you know, a team like Slovenia or so forth. So it'd be maybe nice if they had a, a matchup with some of those teams. Um, there are teams uh, from the Pacific that may be a little weaker. So there's a kind of way in which I mean, if you can see them in a group with maybe two teams where they where you feel like they've got a very solid chance of, of winning, they're going to be in a group uh, with a very solid team since it's, it's there's eight teams you know that are seated. So the real question is. Who are kind of the other two teams going to be? Is there is there a, a reasonable chance that they're going to beat them um, in order to get into the next round? And after that, I mean, the, the the great thing is that if once you're in the round of 16, of course, in some ways, you know, it's game by game. And so a team like the U.S., which has done incredible things, you know, defeated Spain last year, um, did well against Brazil in the Confederations Cup final, can certainly, uh, if especially if it can get through into the round of 16, can can certainly surprise and uh, and do well. So I think a lot of people are are hoping that this will be the year. They've been really uh, you know, improving a lot, and, and they've got a really solid, solid group. So um, it's definitely an opportunity for the U.S. So if you could explain to us who are not familiar with the World Cup draw, but say do follow the NCAA tournament and how those mm -hmm. brackets work and fill them out and, uh, and maybe put a little money behind it, mm -hmm. what are the rules here for the World Cup draw and schedule? Um, well, so the schedule is basically already set. In other words, there are, you know, there's a whole set of, and the, and the games will be taking place all over the country. Um, there's 32 teams. Again, there's eight teams. Uh, there's basically, there's eight seeded teams, and each of those teams will be in one group separately. So they've essentially separated what they consider to be the top most competitive teams, and the, and the first seeded team is South Africa as the host. So in that group, you have Brazil, Italy, um, and so forth, some of these real powerhouses. So the idea is to not have, you know, Brazil and Italy in the same in the same group of four, which would essentially lock out whatever two other teams, prob probably lock out whatever two other teams are there. Um, so uh, once, I mean, again, it's a different kind of bracket since there's, thir there's 32, um, and they're basically just groups of four that all play one another um, in, in a set of, and it'll be based on their kind of ultimate uh, pr pr uh, performance within those. I mean, there's a, there's a similarity there too, obviously. Um, so in some ways, I mean, there's, there's I think, a, a certain kind of parallel. I think it's not, you know, it's, it, it's a system that has a very familiar uh, features um, to, to ours in the NCAA. And is there a culture of gambling? I think it would be hard to say that there's none mm -hmm. with uh, this much attention uh, on sports games in, in the obvious uh, competitive structure. Has that been a problem for the World Cup? Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's an interesting question. I mean, there's obviously a massive uh, industry of gambling about these games and about pretty much all football games. I mean, you can type in, you know, on the web, you'll get to any number of places where you can uh, you can uh, sort of participate in, in gambling and pools and so forth. So um, whether it's been a problem, I mean, I, I 
it seems like it's sort of there and it's just part of uh, part of the situation. Different countries regulate it in different ways. Um, FIFA, as far as I know, hasn't been directly that involved in it. Um, there's always obviously suspicions about match fixing, you know, the, but there have been suspicions about that in professional games and notably in Italy and other places there's been uh, even, you know, trials and, and so forth about that. Um, within the World Cup, it's generally been, I mean, there's there there it seems to have been relatively preserved from possible accusations of corruption and so forth, although, you know, there, there have been some of those. Um, I'm seeing some, there's a there's a list here, right? Of course, they're putting the, the list of the seeded teams up, um, which is South Africa, Brazil, Spain, Netherlands, Italy, Germany, Argentina, and England. So each of those teams will be in their own group. Um, and so the draw that we're getting here is for uh, who will be in these groups. And then what about just the basic logistics of where these games are going to be played from a fan's perspective. If I'm a diehard Germany fan, mm -hmm. how does this draw uh, affect that? Well, the games are, you know, as they often are in, in the World Cup, they're going to be put, the, the politics of it, they're really played in a lot of different towns. I mean, obviously, the big the big final is going to be in Johannesburg, and there's going to be semifinal in Cape Town. But there's a lot of games that will be played in, in other parts of South Africa. South Africa is a very big country. Um, so as of today, pl uh, fans will be able to figure out where they need to go. Actually, it was possible through FIFA to buy a kind of ticket package for a team where you would essentially get tickets for all the games that the team would play. Um, but you had to even do that, uh, or you could do that even before you knew whether your team would be fully in. I know that at least England and Brazil, I think those are um, have already been sold out for that uh, th those kinds of tickets. So fans will have to start figuring out how they're going to get from one place to another, um, you know, which games they're going to go to. But this is the round, since nobody knows who's going to be in the round of 16, um, this is really the round in which people can be sure they, if they want to see their team play, they can, they can go there. Now, of course, if you're confident that your team will make it through the group, uh, it's never, you know, one can be confident, one should never be too sure, um, then you can also figure out from the schedule where they would play in their round of 16 games as well. So um, but it's been hard to schedule. I mean, myself, I got tickets for later games, for round of 16 games, for quarterfinal games, without really knowing, you know, who would be playing in those games, but just knowing that they'll be great games. Um, uh, so, but if you want to follow a team after today, that'll be a little bit more possible. Professor Dubois, I think you have set us up well to watch this World Cup draw. And uh, you spent a full hour with us here doing office hours. So uh, as we wrap up here and the actual balls get pulled from the bowls mm -hmm, uh, yeah. in Cape Town, uh, any kind of final words about the draw in particular or just, you know, the sport of soccer and um, and your take on it? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with the draw. I urge everybody to, to find a place to, to see what's going on. Um, you know, I think this is just going to be an incredible event. I mean, there's sort of nothing like it. Uh, it's it's something that I think people, you know, no matter how interested or not you are in the sport, this is something where you can really see um, so much going on, both on the field and outside of it. So, I mean, I just sort of urge people to to think about it and to join in the the fun and the pleasure of of both watching and and uh, thinking about this game and and how it's kind of shaped the world and continues to shape it. Professor Dubois, thank you for taking time to hold your office hours with us today. And to keep the conversation going with Professor Dubois, you can visit his Soccer Politics website at SoccerPolitics.com. Everyone is, of course, invited to watch the World Cup draw. To learn more about Duke, visit Duke.edu.